Microsoft just released a colossal new wall-mounted computer, headless robotic dancing dogs, and Twitter just crowdsourced the fight against internet trolls. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 356 for Wednesday, June 10th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is your evening update to the tech news. Joining us to discuss today's big stories is Alex Wilhelm from TechCrunch. Welcome back, Alex. Good to be here. Hi. So Microsoft announced that uh, next month, you too can shell out $20,000 for a dinormous computer you can hang on your wall. It's the Surface Hub. It's There's a 55-inch version and an 84-inch. They're wall tablets designed for business conference room. Uh, they'll go on sale July 1st. Now, the smaller version will be $7,000, and the larger version, like I said, will cost you $20,000. Where are you going to hang your $20,000 wall computer, Alex? So it's really embarrassing, actually. I've, uh, I've played with both the 55 and the 84, and I actually went to my apartment and tried to find a wall big enough to support the 84. And uh, I, I live in SF, so I don't have a lot of wall space. So unfortunately, there's no place in my apartment to fit the, uh, the large one. So, sad so, times. Yeah, so you'll have to use it for the TechCrunch uh, conference room, the one that you've already bought, right? I think applying for budget from Verizon to buy a $20,000 wall computer would be a little tough, but I will try, because I really want one. They are very, very fun devices to play with. So what, what can people do with them? What can businesses do with them? Well, you, you think about it as a combination of, of whiteboard, computer, and video conferencing unit, kind of all in one thing. So all the apps you can use for Windows 10 are there. A really strong Skype experience is there and also a really strong whiteboarding function. So if you if you want to build out a conference room and have a full tech stack, you can just install one of these on the wall and kind of be done with it. It's plug and play. Um, people often put in you know whiteboards and then smart whiteboards and then projection equipment and all that. This is kind of a one-stop shop for your meeting needs. Right. I mean, it's supposed to make meetings more fun, less boring, less annoying. Those you know, get rid of those little star-shaped. Uh, conference call thingies where you can, you know, are all saying, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Right, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, when you walk up to the 84-inch uh, Surface Hub, well, at least I just wanted to play with it immediately. Like, I just wanted to start drawing all over because it's so big. And Windows itself is just a better experience on a larger screen. And that's always been true. And so I feel like the, the device is really, really neat, and I want one, but I'm not quite sure how big the market demand will be at the $20,000 side. So I'm very curious to watch and see uh, how it sells. Right. And so uh, it's interesting because, I mean, if this really is designed to fit our, you know, lifestyle, the work lifestyle, the remote lifestyle. I mean, there was an article in Time about it today. It said 50 percent of all meetings include a person calling into it. So I guess that's the that's what Microsoft is aiming for. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, the device itself has a lot of cool features built into it. So it's not just a touchscreen. It has uh, special cameras, special microphones. Um, so special software to let you quickly log in and put your data onto it for different meetings securely. So it's really been, it's a Windows 10 device that's been tweaked and improved specifically for this use case. And I think it's also Microsoft in a way showing off what they can do with Windows to kind of prove out that people should really be building more stuff for Windows that are not just PCs. Um, but of course, that'll be an OEM question moving forward. Right. The other in the interesting thing is that they're building them in the United States, not overseas. They've built a factory in Portland uh, to build them. Uh, is that something that a lot of companies are aiming towards doing? Is it just sort of they're, they're doing it just to show off that they're not and that they're keeping jobs in the U.S.? I don't think they're trying to show off. I think they did it for some other reason. But, I mean, flip over your iPhone and see where it was manufactured. I mean, that's, I think, the, the standard answer to that question. Um, I'm from Oregon, so I'm pretty excited to see Oregon get some more manufacturing jobs. But, I mean, the factory in question probably isn't the world's largest because these are very high-end devices. Um, if they keep manufacturing in the U.S. as the product line expands, that'll be even better. But that's kind of a five-year question. Right. Well, let's move on to the story uh, about uh, Box, their cloud storage company. They just released their earnings, and uh, you actually just got off the phone with their CEO, Aaron Levy. Uh, yes. they, they reported revenue of $65.6 million, adjusted earnings per share of a negative $0.28, cents, and whereas the street expected Box to lose an adjusted $0.31 cents per share on the revenue of $63.7 million. You are going to need to explain to me what that means. <laughs> what it means is they had more money in the door and less money out the door than people thought. So Box still lost money, 
but their revenue grew faster than people expected and their losses were smaller. So they've proven that they can in fact make more money more quickly while spending less to do so. That means their margins are improving and their business is healthier than the people expected. And given that higher pulse essentially of their of their you know strong indicators, their stock is up about eight percent after hours, after rising five percent during the day. So it's a really huge day for Box's investors and their team because after their last earnings report, they dropped about 15%. And I think that's very bad for morale internally. But now that they have this win on the books, it's kind of a um, you know, beat the chest moment for their entire team because they just showed all their haters, and they have a lot of them, that they can do this. So I think it's a good quarter, but I mean, certainly it's their second as a public company. So we don't want to get too far ahead of our skis. Right. So why do they have a lot of haters? Well, when you... <laughs> When they filed their S1, there was a lot of hype around the company. People were expecting, I think, a certain financial picture, and Box did not meet that. And so it became a fashionable thing among the stupid pundit Arati of the tech people, I guess I'm part of that, um, to kind of rag on Box and, and mock them for their losses and claim they were going to die and so forth. Peter Bright from Ars is one of their uh, strongest critics. Um, but instead of, not, instead of dying, Box pulled off an IPO and then this very strong report. So I feel like they've mostly proven themselves out, but until they're profitable, you know, questions will still linger. I think this is such an interesting industry because it's it's relatively new. Um, I mean, I'm sure we can compare it to you know oil or gas or all the kinds of you know industries when they were new. But uh, it doesn't make sense to me how Box thinks how Box is going to compete with Microsoft or Google or Amazon. I mean, they just they can just offer all this space uh, because they have all these other you know they're huge companies. How how is right. Box going to do this? Well, the downside for Microsoft today is like Microsoft has what twenty seven thousand different products, you know. And so they have OneDrive for Business, which is theoretically a, a competitor to Box or, you know, SharePoint. But I mean, Box does a couple of things and does them very well, you know. And so if you look at the whiteboard behind me, there's notes from my call there, and, and there's two acronyms, EKM and DE. Those are two new Box products. One's encryption and one's a developer tool that is going to drive revenue for them for a few years. And they can focus in on enterprise encryption in that way and therefore drive sales inside of different verticals. Microsoft's probably not nimble enough to do that given its scale. It has to build for everyone at once, whereas Box can go after just entertainment or just finance. And so I think, you know, as they grow, their their vertical plan is their their almost their business model value prop. But I mean also they're dynamic, they have a strong sales team, and they have a pretty robust product line. So I don't see why they have to lose just because they're smaller. Right. And it, what my question is, I mean, they do have a free consumer t personal tier. Yes. Uh, why are they going after consumers at all? What's what's behind that? Well, I don't think they're really going after consumers anymore per se, but they want to have a free tier out there so that way I can take Box into my company. So if I'm a Box user and I like Box and my, you know, my CEO comes up and says, hey, you know, we should get some cloud storage, I go, well, I already use Box, why don't we just call them? And so it's a way into these larger corporations without a lot of friction. And if you're a sales guy and you roll into the, you know, the CIO's office and say, hey, you know, 2,000 of your employees use Box right now and you're not managing it, you should pay us so you can manage it. It's a relatively strong uh, lever you can pull to increase the sales uh, cycle. Um, and also, how expensive are they really? I mean, these free users are probably, what, half active, and the price of storage has gone down so much in the last five years, who really cares? Right. So, yeah, they're kind of going after the same model that drop, like Dropbox to Dropbox for Business. Dropbox yes. for Business is a sponsor of Twit, I should say that, full disclosure. Uh, but that, <laughs> that's the same model, right? Like, they have, everyone fell in love with Dropbox, and then they said, you know, why don't we just use this? Why are we using that other complicated thing, right? Absolutely. And I think it's worked out very well for them. But I think that stage of cloud deployment in the enterprise has kind of passed. I think that was a much more important thing two years ago. So if you're Box, what do you do? Do you turn off your free layer or do you just take the cost and you say, okay, it'll go, it'll go down over time compared to our revenue, so we don't really care about it. But if you turn off the free layer, you piss off a lot of people and then you have bad press cycles and everyone whines and it's, you know, is, is it really worth the trouble? I, I say probably not. Right. Uh, so all this week we've been talking about Apple's WWDC conference, which is supposed to be for developers, but the keynote is really just a big tech marketing event, I think. Uh, now, you guys did a good job of putting together a list of the announcements for OS, iOS 9 and how they measure up to products already on the market. Uh, so some of the improvements in iOS 9 will supercharge your iPad uh, if you use it for work. Now, do you think these changes will make it comparable to the Surface? Um, well, I think the service is just a different device in general, and Windows is very different than, than OS X. But I think split screen in iOS 9 for iPad is really cool. I, I think it would have been cool three years ago as well, but I mean, better late than never with something that's going to be pretty functional. Um, I wonder if this uh, is a prelude to a larger screen iPad, given that having a split screen is better when you have more screen space per side. Uh, but that's just speculation. Uh, I think it's cool, and I think Apple definitely is making a larger enterprise push in general. And so to see them do this is kind of a furthering of that already in place uh, action. 
right? And of course, everyone's comparing Apple Music to Spotify. Spotify had a news today that they they have basically one new subscriber every second. They doubled their subscribers. It's crazy. So, I mean, do you what you've heard about Apple Music? Do you think that uh, are you a sub Spotify subscriber now? I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've been for a long time. And would, is this any of the announcements that they make you think you might switch to Apple Music? No. I mean, I mean, I, 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 the launch wasn't as bad as titles per se, but I mean, I, Apple's big emphasis on human curated radio isn't attractive to me. The reason I love Spotify is because I have built a 900 song work playlist that is an amalgamation of all the things that I love and no one could ever do that for me. No one can really drive me through my own musical taste that way. And Spotify really lets me curate my own musical existence. And to lose that control as a selling point is, is not, not that compelling. So I, I'm not chuffed per se. Apple though has amazing scale. An amazing reach and a lot of credit cards on file. So if they can really leverage that into a quick you know, subscriber growth, it can hurt Spotify's own growth over the next three to five years. But, you know, at, at least I am staying put. All right. And you guys also compared it to SoundCloud, which has, you know, traditionally been a place where unknown artists could, you know, have their music be heard. Um, and that's it's sort of what the Apple Connect is doing. Do you, do you think it'll be a competitor to SoundCloud? Well, I think about Connect more as competitor to Ping, which is Apple's prior social network uh, inside of iTunes that went nowhere. Um, I think Connect is cool because it allows artists to really talk to the, their fans. But I mean, right now, I follow a rapper by the name of Ritz, R-I-T-T-Z, big fan. And, you know, I just follow him on Instagram and Twitter. And that's kind of how I connect with him. And that's where he puts all of his stuff. So I guess the people that you really care about moved their content over to Connect. And therefore, you had to go there to get that same content you already kind of have. It's interesting. But, you know, you know it's, it's definitely going to come down to how many people actually use it. And are they saying anything interesting? So. Right. I mean, do you think that uh, this is kind of what Apple often does? They go into a market just kind of a little bit late and then they, they do things better? Well, Microsoft did that for years and it worked. I mean, they were late to the Internet. Internet Explorer came out, wasn't very good, still won. So Apple certainly has the scale and the platform reach to try that. But I mean, I think there's more balance out there with the Android iOS war that will limit their ability to stomp on people, especially when Spotify now has 20 million paid subscribers. You know, that's, that's a lot. Um, and that momentum builds on itself. And especially when their product isn't that differentiated, I think they're going to have a harder time. But I mean, they were late to MP3 players to a certain extent, if you want to go back that far. And then they just destroyed everyone and built the entire market. So I never want to talk bad about Apple's chances because they tend to win. And then I tend to look really stupid. So. <laughs> So before I let you go, I wanted to touch briefly on a new feature that Twitter started rolling out today that lets you yes. export your blocked user lists. So if there are people attacking certain groups of people, then victims can share these lists and make it easier to block and mute people before they even see their mean tweets. Uh, so I thought this was an interesting use of crowdsourcing. What do you think? I think it's really smart and a great product and one that will hopefully be used a lot by people who need it. I just think it's very sad we need to have it. Irish people weren't so absolutely horrible to each other. But uh, given that the, the long history of the human race being terrible to, to itself, I don't think it's going to be going to change. Um, what I like to see is some guides for people on how to actually use this tool. So if I don't know, per se, how to get around, how to block people effectively and, you know, pop up accounts and so forth, I think it'd be good to have, give people some help. Because if you're going to build a tool and just give it to people, I think we as a community should help people use it effectively so they don't get harassed more, more than we can avoid, I guess. Right. So did you, it hasn't been rolled out to me yet. Did you, did you have that feature yet? In your well, I blocked like two people total. So I, I'm not really, I mean, I, I'm a really boring, straight, cis, head, white dude. So like no one really cares to harass me. Like, but my, my, my female friends that are writers are like excited because they have a huge problem with harassment. And yeah. so I'm really excited to see new tools built for them because then they can defend themselves. Because it's not fair that I should get to live in the internet and have no one harass me and they, just due to their gender, under a delusion of harassment. That's just crap, I think. Right. So anything we can build to help them, I'm completely behind. Yes. And then, but speaking of, before you said that people are generally horrible. So the thing that I thought about was um, this kind of felt a little bit like it could be used for like a McCarthy era blacklisting type thing. Um, I, I mean, I would like to think that all people would use it just to crowdsource, you know, the trolls. But you know, if you're asking, giving people the possibility to create a list of people that, you know, you don't want to follow or you don't want to let you follow on Twitter, there, there could be some negatives to that, I think. So you could build a list of people that aren't trolls, but you just don't like. Like, here's 10, you know, 10 journalists not to follow on Twitter. Right, exactly. Well, 
I made a Twitter list a while a while ago called the worst journalists, and I just add my friends to it when they piss me off. <laughs> so I think we're we're kind of already there. Uh, but I mean, if people do use it for that, um, more power to them. You know, a hatchet swings both directions. <laughs> right. Well, Alex, thank you so much. It is always a pleasure to speak to you. Alex Wilhelm is a writer at TechCrunch, and he was apparently the first Alex on Twitter. He is at Alex. You don't even have any haters for being at Alex. People tried to buy it from me, but I wasn't actually first. I actually bought it off a guy in Mexico in 2008, so. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> well, no one used Twitter back then, so it was a little easier. Right. How much did you pay? All the money I had, which was 60 bucks at the time, so. Oh, totally yeah. worth it, probably. Uh, well, yeah, by a factor of, like, a lot. So I, <laughs> stupid lucky move because I was broke at the time, but, uh, you know, yeah. some things pay off. Good investment. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Take care. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> Coming up, Elon Musk's internet in space. And what is this cute Google robot dancing dog hiding? But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who just want to make things happen. Maybe you want to develop an app, learn WordPress, boost your productivity, or sharpen your business skills. lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. If you're looking to expand your creative skills, lynda.com's new courses include before and after graphic design best practices, foundations of layout and composition, grids, foundations of drawing, sketching the landscape, and Adobe Digital Publishing Suite Essential Training. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2, and we thank them for their support. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. When Apple releases iOS 8.4 at the end of this month, you will get, as we said, the Apple Music. And according to Mac rumors, you will also get a fix for the iMessage bug that crashes Macs, iPhones, and even Apple Watches. And we've been reporting on this bug for a few weeks. If someone sends you a specific string of Unicode characters, your app will quit and sometimes your device will crash. Apple has published workarounds that include turning off notifications on your lock screen and asking Siri to read your messages for you. But those who've installed the beta of iOS 8.4 claim that the permanent fix is on its way. And alas, iOS users are learning what Windows users have known for decades, and that is that bugs are a lot like weeds. One gets fixed and another one pops up in its place. Security researcher Gian Sosik writes that a bug in the iOS Mail app could allow a hacker to load remote HTML content, replacing the content of an original email message in order to create sophisticated and familiar-looking pop-ups that ask for passwords, login data, and other personal or financial information. So be careful where you enter your personal information. Your Apple device does not make you immune to the bad guys. And would you watch an ad in exchange for free power for your electric car? A company called Volta thinks you will, and so do all the investors who just forked over $7.5 million in new financing. In total, the company has raised $12.5 million in equity and project financing. VentureBeat reports that Volta's EV charging stations are free to the user and free to the companies who own the land where the charging stations are built. And Ford, Forbes says that the only people paying are the advertisers, and according to Volta, it appears to be worth it to them to support free electricity. This summer, Volta will release an app that will help electric car owners find their charging stations and notify them when they've reached their two to three hour limit. Now, Tesla owners currently have their own free charging stations, but not everyone drives a Tesla, sadly. And speaking of Tesla, today in Elon Musk news, the SpaceX uh, CEO finally, he officially wants to rebuild the internet in space. Musk is petitioning the FCC for permission to launch a constellation of 4,000 cheap satellites into space in order to beam high-speed internet signals to remote areas. We reported this back in January when it was just a rumor, and now it appears to be true. Facebook had a similar space internet plan, but earlier this week we told you Zuckerberg thought it was too expensive, to which Elon Musk just shrugged and apparently said, I have enough money to do anything. Now, if you're lucky enough to get invited to a Google Ventures barbecue, you might get to see a headless robot dog dancing. That is a cute robot dog. Can we see him dancing? Oh, yeah, there he is. I don't know why they never have heads. Very cute. But am I the only one thinks that this, who thinks that this dancing headless robot dog is intended to hide something? It's like the magic of Google Photos. Look, we're going to let you store all your photos for free and we'll even automatically add filters and create stunning musical creations from your pictures. Meanwhile, we are mining them for every last shred of personal information that you have left. 
And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.